it's that time again. Late Night Crypto Talk with Bitcoin Brandon. We're going to get started in just a moment here. Wednesday night. What's going on, Mr. May? Hello, Judith from New Zealand. Awesome. Welcome tonight. What's going on, Charles? We are blessed and highly favored as we come to the end of 2017. guys are having a good evening tonight i have a wonderful day we've had a wonderful christmas time getting ready to start a brand new year so let's go ahead and get started tonight hope you guys had a wonderful christmas eric may from houston emma's from houston Eric asked, do I think the fork's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. I, I thought that it was the fork was supposed to be a good thing, and then all of a sudden I'm seeing articles about people are upset about it. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. I don't like what they're calling it, Bitcoin God. I think that's just silly. Uh, but it's supposed to solve some problems and issues like the high cost of the transaction fees and the slow time, how long it's taken to confirm transactions. It's supposed to solve all that, but we'll see. But let's talk about first the crime. Wait, wait, let me see. We'll see what articles I have here. Oh, the, we've got some word from the FDIC. I want to read this article. From the FDIC. Let me copy the link so that you guys can either read along with me or just sit back and listen. Remember to always be educating yourselves. Always be learning. That's what I do. At least twice a day, I'm always reading this stuff. So, let's see. Alright, former FDIC chair Sheila Bear on Bitcoin says value, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. Former Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Chair Sheila Bear was given a platform on Yahoo Finance to share her thoughts on the world's most popular cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. While she trucks in regulatory speak, some of her ideas might surprise crypto enthusiasts. Regulatory speak? What is that? Nerd talk? All right, we're about to find out. Bitcoin's value is psychological. Eh, yeah, kind of. Agreeing the current price run-up is indeed a bubble. Agreeing to what? All right, this is already starting off. I don't like who wrote this article. Edward Kelso. So it starts off saying, agreeing the current price run up is indeed a bubble. The former FDIC chair asked rhetorically what should be done. She alludes to Nobel Prize economist Joseph Stieglitz. Everybody always wants to run to him. Bromide at the digital asset for having no socially useful function, calling for an outright ban. But then she insists value, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. Ms. Baer was appointed by President W. Bush to a five-year term from, from summer 2006 through President Obama's first term, ending summer of 2011. The FDA, you know, it's all right, so look at this time frame. She was there right before and after of the biggest economic collapse in American history since the Great Depression. So keep this in mind as we read this. 
because she sat here in charge of things when everything went to hell. So let's see what she has to say. And the reason why I say that is because I don't think a lot of critics, when it comes to Bitcoin, they don't fully understand why. They don't realize that it is a result. It is a reaction to the financial collapse of 2008 when everybody had their trust in the banks, the mortgages, and the government system. And you lost your jobs, you lost your houses, you lost your savings and your 401k. Bitcoin allows us to have control of our own money, like we are our own bank, because we don't have confidence anymore in the system. That's why Bitcoin is popular and why it's here. And she was in office during this span of time. So let's see what she has to say. Runs usually occur when confidence is lost in the deflationary aspect of a currency, and folks can see the value dropping. The quicker they get to it and spend it, trading it for something that holds better value, the less they'll suffer. The FDIC since 2011 guarantees deposits up to $250,000 based on that private pool of $100 billion credit from the U.S. Treasury. Currently close to 6,000 banks subscribe. Unfortunately, Ms. Baer misses a chance to explain Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network underlying it to do possess inherent value as they make it both a token and payment system. Instead, she equivocates, stating, Since the beginning of commerce, humans have assigned value to things of no readily apparent intrinsic worth. That's true. Particularly in the case of mediums of exchange, aka currency, we assign value simply because those with whom we transact do so as well. All right, let me stop right there. Remember, she was in office appointed by President Bush. When the collapse happened, President Bush did a famous speech where he said, What holds our society together, what holds our economy together, is the American people's faith and belief in the U.S. dollar. Because we value it, is why it's we're going to stay afloat. So she was here during that state. So this statement she makes makes sense to her. So let me continue. Whether it is the cowrie shells of ancient India or the thin green pieces of paper many of us still carry in our wallets today, worth depends more on psychology than physical attributes, she argues. I agree with that. With the best of intentions, she rifles through use cases where faith in government, what did I just say? What did Bush say? Faith in government. Where faith in government fiat failed, such as in Germany and Southeast Asia. She does acknowledge the strong allure of peer-to-peer -peer transacting and how, unlike fiat currency, its finite supply and purposeful constraints on the pace of mining Make it attractive to many as a store of value similar to gold. Well, she does understand that. Okay, she understands that part. She attributes Bitcoin prices to mania, but cautions government against feeding the frenzy. Banks participating in FDIC protection and services should not be allowed to participate, she warns. Stop right there. Remember, well, the FDIC is an insurance for the banks. However, Bank of America, the second largest bank in the United States, and Chase are both heavily invested in the Bitcoin space. In fact, Bank of America has 20 blockchain patents and is working on a system to create their own exchange where their customers can store their cryptocurrencies and exchange it with fiat currency directly through the bank. So I don't know who she's trying to scare here. The banks are already doing it. So she's saying they shouldn't be allowed to participate. Why? Oh, I know why. Because she thinks that Bitcoin and cryptos has no value other than what we say it has. So it shouldn't be allowed to also be under the protection of the FDIC, which in her mind is real money. The fiat currency is real money. And, and I'm not challenged that because what is the real value of the dollar in your hand right now? You know, it's worth 5% of what it was 100 years ago. But that dollar is only worth the paper that it was printed on. I like what 
what uh, John McAfee says. He says, when you want to look at the value of a Bitcoin, the fact that it costs today nearly $2,000 just to create one Bitcoin because you have to take into account the miners, their rigs, the electricity. It, it's, a, it's a proof of work. It costs money. If it, and if it wasn't valuable, nobody would put their, their time in to try to create it. So it costs more money to create a Bitcoin than it does a U.S. dollar. So let me continue. She doesn't address that. It says, and while that would be an unpopular decision in the short run, it actually might win broad approval from Bitcoiners who fear banks and their meddling. I don't know what she's getting at there. Because the banks can't meddle in Bitcoin. There's nothing they can do. They can't, it can't be stopped. Bill Gates said that. Miss Baer lauds the New York license and believes CBOE and CME futures contracts will ultimately bring more regulation to her mind stability to the digital asset by the very nature of sharing information with crypto exchanges. I agree with that as well. She is also appreciative of the SEC's more aggressive moves against ICOs. I agree with that as well. She too uses the blockchain buzzword and she reveals she is part of a business dealing in the tech. And it's ironic because of the usage of that word seems to be the real bubble. Businesses simply attaching blockchain to their names have seen crazy rises in valuations. Finally, she saves her soundest advice for last. The best discipline for Bitcoin speculation is the recent fall in price by one third. All right, let me stop right there. Two things she said here. The first part I agree with where she says that businesses that are changing their names and, and, and putting the name the word blockchain on it, these businesses have had like a thousand percent increases in stock value just because they added blockchain to their name. Whether they're actually going to do anything with it or not, who knows? But they're not stupid. So she's correct in that part. Here's where she's not correct. And this is what critics always jump on. Because Bitcoin dropped one third that's called a market correction. That's been happening in the past nine years. She's looking at it as, see, I told you so. It crashed. It's a bubble. So she still has some learning to do, but she's kind of on the right track. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to fault her too much there. Let's go on to, let's talk about the crime. Crime that's taken place with Bitcoin. And I have two articles here covering that. First, we're going to talk about cryptocurrency crimes continue to run rampant, expected to increase in 2018. This is why security of your coins is so important. Why those of you coming from the MLM space and you're used to marketing a certain way on social media by bragging about how much money you make, flashing your car, or for most of you, it's a rental car, or your, your fancy home, well, we don't know if it's your home or not. And you flaunt money around. You know, that might work to entice people on the MLM side. But doing that on the crypto side can get you, <laughs> can get you got, can get you robbed, kidnapped. You're a target. So you do not, you know, watch what you say and what you share. This is the reason why I act a certain way. People don't even know what I'm involved in. When it comes in the crypto space, that's my business. So let's read this article here and I put it in the chat box so you can follow along. Bitcoin's recent all time high price of $19,666 and the success of smaller digital assets in 2017 has made the owners of cryptocurrencies a rather large target for hackers and fraudsters looking to make a quick buck. Thus with the year coming to a close, it looks increasingly likely that 2018 will see a massive uptick in hacks, scams, and misleading ventures linked specifically to the virtual currency ecosystem. According to CoinMarketCap, the total market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies combined is well over half a trillion dollars. Hey, I'm telling you, another half a trillion is going to be dumped over the next 12 months. Out of which Bitcoin's dominance is, du is, is obvious at an overwhelming 43%. A few years ago, the market cap of Bitcoin alone hovered $2 billion. 
with his competitors nowhere near as popular or successful. With this increased influx of wealth and subsequent multiplying of prices, ordinary investors are now in absolute control over large amounts of cryptocurrencies. Since the premise of such digital assets involves being one's own bank, the security of a user's funds is also entirely up to them. As a result, a lot of people, especially those less technically inclined, fail to sufficiently secure their funds from hackers. Furthermore, digital assets are structured in such a way that it is very difficult to track the funds once it is no longer in one's possession, making preventing the only measure that is realistically possible. This is, let me stop right there. This is the gold rush taking place in modern day times. If you ever watched old Western movies, remember the old uh, people that staked their claim out West to get their riches? But what followed them? The crime followed as well. All the bank robbers, the, the train robbers, the, uh, the, the, the carriage robbers, you know, because they knew gold was being transferred from one place to another, and they got robbed in transit. Well, picture that only today on steroids. While this is the greatest economic shift in wealth in the history of mankind for the most amount of people, it is also the heyday for hackers. This is the best time to be alive, to be a hacker. I mean, it is like a candy, a kid in a candy store for them making money. This is where each and every one of you have to be responsible for your own security. Got to be careful with this. I like that, Eric. You got to guard, guard the stagecoach. So let me continue. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security discovered that as much as a third of Bitcoin exchanges between 2013 and 2015 were hacked alongside of a myriad of other scams and predatory behavior. This period represented, in contrast, a bear market for cryptocurrencies. Since then, the rising prices have done nothing but add further motive for hackers to siphon funds from exchanges and high-profile individual investors. In December 2017, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, announced that it had intervened and halted a fast-moving initial ICO fraud that had reportedly raised over $15 million from investors. Additionally, the SEC announced that it was keeping a close eye on potentially similar ICO scams in the future. Since the value of a cryptocurrency is derived and not intrinsic, there is no real insurance, FDIC or private, securing investors against the loss of their digital assets. In other words, it's like you're putting money underneath your pillow. There was a story out here in L.A. last week about an old gentleman who, for whatever reason, and they never got into why, he had over $150,000 stashed in his house. And guess what happened? I don't know. Somebody knew he had that money. They robbed his house and took it. It's gone because it wasn't in the bank where it was safe. Well, this is the wild, wild west right now. There is no one bank for Bitcoin. You are in control of your bank. A lot of people are using cold storage, meaning like a, like a flash drive, like a treasure, treasure wallet. And then putting their Bitcoins on that and then putting it in a safety deposit box. You know, the, the, most, the most risky places to be storing your coins are on exchanges. And people only use the exchanges because they're, they're trading. You do not want to hold. I don't hold anything on like Coinbase or any on, on, online wallet that I don't control the keys. You know, my stuff is offline. It's off the network. And I'm not even saying where I got mine. I don't want to be a target. And as a matter of fact, don't even target me. I ain't got nothing. <laughs> I have no coins for anybody to steal. So you got to be careful. But the exchanges can get hacked, and they have. All right, so let me continue. 
Since the value of a cryptocurrency is derived and not intrinsic, there is no real insurance, FDIC, or private securing investors against the loss of their digital assets. Even massive exchanges such as Coinbase are only FDI insured to the extent of the user's fiat balance. In the event of a hack or fraud involving the loss of digital currencies, it is unlikely that the cryptocurrency lost by the affected investors will ever be reimbursed, as was the case with Mt. Gox, the now defunct exchange that suffered a fatal hack in 2013. Investors, especially those with a large stake in cryptocurrencies, need to be educated about these risks and of measures that can be taken to mitigate the damage of hacks against them. Using a reliable antivirus, an email service with anti-phishing measures turned on, two-factor authentication, password managers, and hardware wallets are all legitimate ways to safeguard currency and improve security by a significant amount. A protocol for securing crypto assets has also been drawn up for the rich and paranoid. That said, no system can ever be completely foolproof. Oh, there's a link for that. All right, I'll save that link and we'll cover that tomorrow morning for early morning crypto talk. But uh, in other words, guys, if you don't have at least two factor authentication, you're just asking yourself to get hacked. It is a must. You have to have two factor, whether it's the Authy, it's an app called Authy, A U T H Y, and Google Authenticator. It's a must. And if you do so, Whenever you're on a site and it's asked if you want to set up a 2FA, two, two, two-way factor, it gives you a barcode on the screen that you're supposed to like scan with your phone. Always do it with two devices, at least. Like if you've got a tablet and you've got a phone or your phone or your wife's phone or vice versa, scan it so you have it on two devices. You don't, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody lost their phone or wipe their phone, or something happened, and they they can't access their account because they lost their Google Authenticator. Always have a backup to a backup to a backup. All right, let's talk about getting kidnapped because this is serious business going on in Eastern Europe and in Russia. People getting snatched up <laughs> for their money, for their coins. It also happened here. I did, what was it, maybe two weeks ago I did a Facebook Live where a guy's friend, his friend, had somebody hold him up at gunpoint for, well, they still about $1.5 million worth of Bitcoin. All right, let's see. This is uh, Russia. Let me get this link. Hey, if you guys are getting any value from anything that I'm sharing, go ahead and spam up that like and hearts button. Let me know that uh, this is valuable to you. Copy. And let's paste. I see my little cousin, Kivan J, hopped on here. I am grooming him right now. He is going to be a cryptocurrency millionaire before he's 25 years old. <laughs> you hear that, Kivan J? Before you're 25 years old. All right. Russian reports say crypto entrepreneur Pavel Lerner kidnapped, kidnapped in Kiev. Is it pronounced Kiev or Kiev? I always get that messed, messed up. And Kivanje, always be learning. Always be learning. Got to take care of my family. All right, Russian programmer and cryptocurrency investor Pavel Lerner has been kidnapped in Kiev. According to Ukrainian and Russian media reports, he is the managing director of Exmo, a major UK-based exchange popular with Russians for accepting ruble payments. Lerner is also well-known in Ukraine, where he has startups dealing with mining operations and blockchain technology. Thank you, Ki Ki Kiev. Kiev, all right. Yeah. Let's see this guy. Oh, man. He got himself kidnapped. The Russian-born IT specialist stopped answering phone calls around noon on December 26 and was reported missing by friends and colleagues later the same day, according to strata.ua. Quoting a police source, 
The website revealed that Lerner had been dragged into a van by unidentified attackers wearing masks. I mean, this is straight out of a movie. He was supposedly abducted close to his office on the Stepan Bandera Boulevard in the Ukrainian capital. Investigators in Kiev are considering all possible leads in a case that they have described as kidnapping. Security officials have published the registration number of the vehicle used in the attack and are currently conducting search operations. You know what? I just had a thought. I'm going to buy a freaking compound that has a gate within a gate. Like, <laughs> if you guys ever seen LeVar Ball's new home in Chino Hills, it's like two gated community. We're going to be locked up. <laughs> Seriously. You are your own bank. Got to be careful. Exmo's PR department confirmed media reports in a statement and appealed for any information that could lead to finding Lerner. The company also insisted its operations were not affected and assured its customers that he did not have direct access to cryptocurrency accounts or other personal data. Russian media have covered Lerner's disappearing, drawing parallels with another case involving a Russian national with cryptocurrency background. The 38-year-old Alexander Vinik was detained in Thessalonica this summer while on a vacation in northern Greece. U.S. authorities have accused Vinik of crimes related to the Mt. Gox hack and requested his extradition. American prosecutors claim the Russian has facilitated the laundering of over $4 billion worth of Bitcoin stolen in the hack. Good grief. Vinik who is believed to be the mastermind be be behind the BTCE exchange used for that purpose, has denied the accusations. This month, the Supreme Court in Athens rejected his appeal against the extradition procedure despite objections from Moscow. Russian authorities also want him back home where he has been charged with stealing some $10,000 in Russian currency. Unlike the operators of shadowy BTCE, Pavel Lerner, who has also resided in Poland and Spain, has never attempted to hide his association with Exmo. The exchange he is managing is well known in cryptocurrency circles in both Russia and Ukraine for processing ruble transactions. Man. Be careful out there. I'm going to travel with a personal security. All right. Here's this is and this one I've been waiting to read because it deals with the Fed coin. And this is coming in America. It ain't, it ain't just talked about. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. So let me copy this link for you. Bitcoin has changed the world. Fedcoin could take it one step further. In 1999, online payments were revolutionized by PayPal, and it took the world by storm. Fast forward 10 years and Bitcoin is introduced. The pioneer of a unique digital currency and virtual payment system that was years ahead of its time. Bitcoin took four years to reach the $100 mark, six months to increase tenfold to $1,000, and four more years to jump tenfold again, reaching $10,000 in November of 2017. Just a month later, Bitcoin flirted dangerously close to $20,000 and is showing promise for increased surges in 2018. Bitcoin's value is not exclusively a digital currency and high-risk investment. Through the imitation and ad 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 adapt what can I say that adaptation of Bitcoin's blockchain technology and the success thereof, hundreds if not thousands of new cryptocurrencies have been formed. As of November 27, 2017, there were 1,324 cryptocurrencies actively available for use or investment on the Internet. This figure does not include the number of cryptocurrencies that were deemed failures and shut down by developers or the number of cryptocurrencies still under development that is yet to be released. Digital currencies have more than proven their potential with many new ones perhaps better than Bitcoin regarding transaction speeds, transaction costs, security, and scalability. Although central banks have not widely adopted them, they have probably caught their attention and that of global governments. Africa has responded with an annual Blockchain Africa Conference. 
The next meeting scheduled to be held in March 2018. Let me think. Let me think. I will be in London in April 2018. That's the Blockchain Expo. All right. The summit will discuss blockchain and cryptocurrency use cases, the regulatory environment, technology hurdles and opportunities in innovation and disruption. According to the official site, with tickets on sale for approximately $270 per person, that's cheap. You know, that one in London, that's costing like almost $1,000 per person. <laughs> North America has taken it one step further and is considering creating a cryptocurrency of their own named FedCoin, which may ultimately replace the United States dollar. They are not alone in this development goal with many other central banks aiming to do the same thing. From their viewpoints, creating a digital currency of their own and having control over it makes better financial sense than investing in an existing and largely more unpredictable cryptocurrency. A logical statement for most reasonable people. That's BS, by the way. I'm going to share what the real reason is at the end of this article. That being said, at least for the time being, it is not possible to create a cryptocurrency entirely devoid of risk. FedCoin is a beacon of admission that digital currencies cannot be ignored and are here to stay. Already having changed the way many people think of money, they could be the future of all currencies around the globe. False. What is this, a fluff piece? Who wrote this article? Let me look at this. Priyisha Garg. Ah, it's an interesting name. Let me continue. Although still speculative at this stage, no it's not, the creation of FedCoin would solve a multitude of problems for the U.S. government. Blockchain technology makes it entirely impossible to counterfeit money and increasingly difficult to hide it as a public ledger stores all transactions. Additionally, a national cryptocurrency would significantly enhance the government's ability to manage the economy. That's true. As it stands, the Federal Reserve has the power to lower interest rates during times of economic difficulty, but this power is substantially limited as the interest rate, can, uh, rate cannot practically be reduced below zero. This characteristic would be different for a government-controlled cryptocurrency, which would support negative interest rates. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You guys don't know what they're trying to do. FedCoin would also give governments the ability to implement the idealized concept of helicopter crash, boosting the economy by providing citizens with money. Instead of the practical nightmare that it may otherwise have been, a digital currency makes this possible with no more than a line of code. FedCoin may not necessarily compete with Bitcoin, but use similar technology to operate on an entirely different playing field. The technology would, however, be vastly superior to the initial stream of Bitcoin, being quicker, safer, and more cost effective. Are you kidding me? Additionally, due to its nature of being decentralized to different Federal Reserve banks, it would be less volatile and a, a, be, a better store of value. I'm cracking up reading this, and I'm going to explain why. If we credit Bitcoin with one thing, and one thing only, it would be the step that it has taken towards creating a cashless global economy, with cash becoming an outdated payment method in more ways than one. Bitcoin and the blueprint that it has created is quite literally changing the world as we know it. That last sentence is true. All right, enough of that crap. Here's the real deal. What I just read is a preview of when the Fed coin is, is going to be introduced. That's the language they're going to use. It's going to be about how it's going to be better for all of us. How it's going to make life easier. How it's going to make the government be able to, to operate more securely. That's a bunch of crap. Here's the real deal. And you may not hear this anywhere else. This is why education is so important. The government's job and duty and what it always is, is not to protect the people. It is to control the people. The banks, whoever controls the banks controls everything. And the, re the reason why they don't like Bitcoin is because it is decentralized. They can't control it. Now there's two ways Fedcoin is going to be introduced. Two ways. The first way is as a counter to Bitcoin because the government 
is going to rush, create the Fed coin. The banks already have the blockchain technology on their own Bitcoin, um, on, the, on their own blockchain. They're going to pre-mine all the coins, which means there are no miners out there to mine it and get rewarded. The government's going to control how many coins there actually are, which means they can always add more coins whenever they want to. It's just a digital version of the fiat dollar, making it a cashless society. And they're going to say, don't use that, that scary, volatile Bitcoin that can go down in value overnight. Stay safe here with the Fed coin that's attached to your bank account. You want to use digital currency? Stay here with the Fed coin. The government is controlling it. You can trust us. It's nice and safe and secure just like your bank. Now the average uninformed, ignorant American is going to fall for it. Here's the second way the Fed coin can be introduced. And this is how I think it will be. It'll be forced on us. Why? Go to YouTube and Google or type in Doug Casey. He's one of the foremost American economics uh, futurists, forecasters. He even said, the collapse of 2008, you guys think we're out of that? We're still in it. Think of a difference between a tornado and a hurricane. They both operate the same way. One is just a whole of a lot, hell of a lot bigger. People think that 2008 was just a tornado, but it was a hurricane and the 2008 was the first bands of a hurricane. And as a hurricane moves, you ends up getting into the eye of the storm. And in the eye of the storm, everything is calm. We right now are in the eye of the storm where it's relatively calm, relatively peaceful. The government bailed out the banks and businesses that were too big to fail in 2008. But what happens as that hurricane continues to move? Then you're going to get hit with the back end bands of the hurricane. That's what does the most damage because the front end of it knocks out your defenses. The back end of it wipes everything out. And we are about to get hit with the back ends of that hurricane ban. And there's not, we're not in a situation where the government can bail us out. And the government didn't even bail us out. It bailed out the banks. None of those fools went to jail. We lost our homes, our mortgages, our banks, our savings, our jobs, our 401k, our property, our stock value, all gone. They didn't lose nothing. But now they're not even going to be able to get saved. It's going to cause an economic collapse the likes the world has never seen before. And there's going to be a run on the bank. Here's where the Fed coin is going to happen. When people run on the bank, there is not enough cash in the bank to give to all U.S. citizens who want to pull their money out. There's about $2 trillion of cash in circulation in the United States. There's $11 trillion in cash in Americans' bank accounts. So even if everybody wanted to pull out all their money, there's not enough cash for that to happen. So what do you think the banks are going to do? They're going to freeze. They're going to close their doors and lock them up. This happened briefly in UK just two a couple of months ago for about a week. Nobody will be able to take out their money. Now, before the country burns, the government's going to step in and say, it's okay. We are going to take over the banks. We are going to honor all of your money in the bank accounts Honor it because we're going to introduce a Fed coin. That's a digital dollar. So we're going to go cashless. So we don't have enough cash to give you, but we're going to give you a little debit card or the mark of the beast or whatever it is. You, you know what the mark of the beast is, right? You can't buy or sell anything without the mark. Read Revelations. This is how it begins. So if you want your money in the bank, you have to get this Fed coin. And they're going to say, we're only going to honor maybe 50% of the money in your bank. If you don't get the Fed coin, you're not going to have zero. You're going to have zero. So people will reluctantly, because they're forced, have to get it. And it will be forced on us. Those of us that have been preparing, we don't need the Fed coin. Because you'll be able to survive without your money in the bank. Some 100% self-sufficient, but the vast majority of Americans, this is what they're going to be using. 
And then the, 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 the world, I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now, a couple of months actually. The world and our competitors are moving away from the U.S. dollar. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, they want to get away from U.S. sanctions. They want to marginalize the U.S. dollar. They want to create their own petrol exchange. They want to be able to do whatever they want to do without having to worry about what America has to say about it. So America's not stupid. They may not be saying anything in the media right now, but they know what's going on. And they think, okay, the Fed coin, not only will it be used in the United States, we will now make it the world's Federal Reserve to make, pull, pull everybody back in line. I don't see that happening with this current administration with our isolationist policies. So this is not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. So it is so important that no matter where you are right now, whatever your financial situation is, there is no reason why one year from now you should be in the same situation you are in right now. None whatsoever. I was meeting with my financial people today because my income in 2018 is, I'm not going to say nothing. Let's just say I had to meet with some professionals. Now, we were talking about this, making sure that you're prepared. Where are you going to be one year from now? If you have access to the Internet and you heard about Bitcoin one year from now, you're just as broke then, then as you are right now. Shame on you. Everybody has the potential to completely and radically change their lives. This Saturday, I will be doing my own state of the network marketing industry and the secret going into 2018. So I'll talk more on that in depth this Saturday. I think Saturday morning I'll do the state of the industry. Saturday night I'll do the secret. I do that once a year. It's on YouTube. You can go back every year. I've got one done. And I want to end by giving special shout out and recognition. And it doesn't matter if these gentlemen even hear this video, this, this, this recording. I don't care. Because I'm not doing it for their approval or, recon or, you know, pat on the back. I love to give credit where credit is due. And it's hard to find that in this industry to have people speak good of you. And there's three gentlemen that I want to give a special shout out to for their life achievement in the network marketing MLM industry. Only one of these gentlemen that I know of is got his toe in crypto space but they made a name for themselves in the network marketing industry these are three african-american men see we hear about all about lebron james lonzo ball kobe bryant you know football players and rappers and artists but you don't hear about other black men that are stepping up not only taking care of their families but being a shining example of taking care of their community and not just dozens or hundreds, but thousands of people of lives they've impacted. I have never been in either of these gentlemen's businesses or organizations except Tim Miller recently when we worked together at iCoin Pro. But I've watched them from afar. See, when I first came into this industry, I was 22 years old out of Atlanta, Georgia, right out of college. And I had the benefit of having black mentors in the space. And this has nothing to do with race. It has to do with having a role model that you can relate to, that you can actually touch, feel, and talk to. And I had the benefit. I've had a Sam Orm, a Montrell Jackson, a Harry Flynn, a Gene Flynn, a Jim Duvall, uh, uh, Chris, Chris Oliver, Pasha Oliver. Uh, or, well, Pasha Carter now, Steve Carter, you know, Byron Nelson. I had a lot of black, successful black businessmen in the network marketing space that everything I know today came from their training. But these three gentlemen I'm speaking on tonight, I've learned from afar. They led by example. First, Tim Miller. Tim Miller out of uh, Dallas, Texas, I have a lot of respect for. In his company, he has not only a multiple seven-figure earner, 
but he has helped dozens of people create financial freedom for themselves and their families. He tells it like it is. I don't always agree with him all the time. But I follow him. I watch him. And, oh, and, and you up and coming leaders, watch how you act. You never know who's watching you. Somebody is always watching you that you don't even know. You don't even know their name. That you may impact their lives. Always be mindful of that. I'm mindful of that now based on me coming up. Because I was watching people. They didn't know who I, who I was. So I have to give it up to Tim Miller. By being one of the top money earners as an African American male in this industry. The second is Holton Bugs. He's also out. I think he's more out of Galveston, Texas. I've never met Holton. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, I did. I was early, my early 20s. I met him. I met him before he is Holton, who you know now. Holton at one time was the number one money earner in network marketing, making well almost $2 million a month. Now, I'm not talking about the Amway guys. I'm talking about no modern day. He has helped thousands and thousands of people in this industry and outside of it. A champion, especially in the black community, for somebody to look up to. And the third, the third <laughs> is a gentleman that I also have a whole lot of respect for that I've never met. His name is Kenny Lloyd. Kenny Lloyd, the number one guy in TLC. You know, Tim Miller, Skinny Body Care, Holton Bugs, Organo Gold, Kenny Lloyd, TLC. Kenny comes from great pedigree. His father, Earl Lloyd, was the first African-American basketball player to play in the NBA. So talk about having big shoes to fill. So Kenny never became a professional basketball player, but he earns money like a professional basketball player. Kenny's also out of Houston. What's up with Houston? What's up with Texas? All three of these brothers are in Texas. <laughs> One in Dallas and two in Houston. But Kenny's also another person that I love his style. You know, he's been through a whole lot. But he never has compromised his values and his goals. Even in times of controversy, you never hear him speak negatively about anything. He always focuses on the positivity. When I got promoted, where I became um, vice president of sales and marketing for a network marketing company, you know, Kenny reached out to me. He said, congratulations, man, keep your head up. And he, else, and he said, never compromise your values. You know, and in essence, I was a competitor of his. But, you know, we're Kendrick Spears. We, we, we support each other. And never be in a situation where you feel you can't show and give praise to somebody else. It is not weakness to praise somebody else. And I'm not saying so that you got to praise just your upline. I'm not in their downline. I am observers from afar. And I know they don't get this type of recognition outside of their own downline and team. So I just want to make sure that I want to give credit where credit is due as we go into 2018 that these three brothers keep their head up, keep their vision strong. We're going to face great times in 2018, but we're also going to face challenges, even though we're in different industries, because I'm no longer in the MLM side of things anymore. I'm in the crypto space. Those three are in the MLM space. I just want them to know that I got their back. I'm praying for them. And I wish them the best going into 2018 and to keep changing lives for their organizations and, their, and leading the way for their companies. So with that, guys, I hope the rest of you have a great evening. Get ready for 2018. I've got early morning crypto talk tomorrow morning. Uh, and I'm, what I'm going to go over is this article that I just found. A proto uh, Glacier, a protocol for the rich and paranoid. So it's going to talk about security. So I'm going to go over that one tomorrow morning. So with that, you guys have a great evening. God bless and good night. Bitcoin Brandon out. Bye-bye.